We continue our study in the Gospel of Luke. We come to Luke chapter 11, verse 14. Lord, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke eleven fourteen, And he, that is Jesus, was casting out a demon, and it was mute. So it was, when the demon had gone out, that the mute spoke, and the multitudes marveled. Not every physical problem is caused by a demon, but some are, that's for sure. This man couldn't talk until Jesus got rid of that demon who was the cause of the problem, and the people marveled because they knew he, they knew the boy was, or the guy was, uh, demon-possessed. Verse 15. But some of them said, He cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. Some were determined to believe the very worst about Christ. They had their minds made up. They hated him. And no amount of evidence of the Lord's goodness will change their mind. Some people's biases are evident to everyone except them. 16. And others, testing him, sought from him a sign from heaven. You know, Jesus could not possibly do a miracle that would convince these people that he is God, that he is the Messiah, if the many miracles that he has already done didn't do the job. 17. But he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falls. A man and a woman who cannot agree on important matters are asking for trouble if they get married. I mean, if you don't get along, don't form a partnership. 18. If Satan, Jesus said, also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Because you say, I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Well, let's, let's look at this logically, Jesus is saying. Let's see. Satan puts demons in people because he wants them there to make their life miserable. I get them out of people so that they won't be miserable. What type of stupid logic concludes that Satan and I are partners? There is no logic to that. You know, what, you know what it is? It is hatred without a cause. Verse 19. Jesus said, And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore they will be your judges. In other words, if, if casting out demons is the work of the devil, then your exorcist friends are partners with the devil as well. I mean, if it's true for me, Jesus is saying, then it's true for them. And if, and if you keep saying that, they're going to judge you as being out of your mind because they know how illogical it is. Plus, you're accusing them. You have to be. 20. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. These accusers of Christ have a choice. They can say that anyone, including their friends who cast out demons, are evil. They can say that. Or they can admit that casting out demons is the work of God, which means that Jesus is doing God's work. Now, they're not going to like those two choices, but they're not getting a third. 21. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. If you sit on your front porch with a loaded shotgun, no one's going to try picking a lock on your front door. They wouldn't dare. If you are strong enough, chances are you won't have to use your strength because people won't mess with you. It's a deterrent to all wrongdoers. 22. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. It is not always a good thing. But in this world, strength usually rules. 
If you have a gun, you can take what belongs to me. The good news is, Jesus is stronger than the, than the devil. That's how he was able to take away the people that Satan was possessing and abusing. 23. Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. In other words, there is no neutral ground with Christ. If you are not helping him, then you are hurting him. If we are not helping to get out God's word, or praying for things, or doing what he wants, then automatically we are working against him. If you are not living for Jesus, then you're living against Jesus. There is no neutral ground. <clears throat> 24. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest. And finding none, he says, I will return to my house from which I came. You know, a demon who is, who's been kicked out of a human is a sad demon. And so he goes around looking for someone to hurt. He wanders around thinking about the good old days, you know, when he was inside of a human tormenting them. Boy, those were good days. And finally the demon says, you know, I'm going back to that guy that I used to be in. Maybe Jesus is gone and maybe I can get back in. Verse 25. And when he comes, Jesus says, he finds it swept and put in order. And so this demon returns to the man that he had possessed earlier and he can't believe his demonic eyes. The man's soul is completely empty. The man had let Jesus drive the demon out of him, but he never repented and replaced the demon with Christ. So he's spiritually hollow. He's there for the taking. 26. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. It is clear that although Christ had delivered the man in this story from the demonic source of evil, the man's own evil heart had not changed. He was delivered, but he never repented, and he never received Christ, so now he's an easy target for more demons. I mean, he looked like he had reformed after the demon left. I mean, that's bound to be an improvement, right? But he never really repented. Repentance is turning from sin and filling that void where sin had been with Jesus Christ. That's repentance. It is a turning away from evil and a turning to Jesus Christ. 27. And it happened, as he spoke these things, that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. In other words, your mother sure is fortunate to have a son like you, Jesus. Somebody yelled that out. And Joseph and Mary had the perfect son. That's true. They lived with Almighty God. They were fortunate for sure. 28. But Jesus said, more than that, blessed are those who bear the word of God, or I should say hear the word of God, and keep it. Jesus is saying that we can have a closer connection with him than the physical physical connection that he had with his mother. When we read scripture, we make a spiritual connection. When we live scripture, we make that connection even tighter. Verse 29, And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, Now, I can tell you right now, that Jesus would have flung, flung preaching class at many Bible colleges today because look at what he said to this crowd. Huge crowd is gathering together. Notice what he, he began to say. This was his opening statement, okay? He says, this is an evil generation. This is an evil generation. That's how he began his sermon. He would have flunked preaching classes in many seminaries today because they would tell you never ever say the word wicked in any of your sermons that's too negative don't be so negative in your preaching Jesus is what they would say say things like you are codependent say that this is a codependent generation 
or dysfunctional generation. That doesn't sound so bad, but don't use the word wicked. You know what I think? I think it is smart to do whatever Jesus did. So I believe I'll stick to biblical terms to describe biblical things and, and not try to uh, soft pedal it by using words that sound better and aren't as offensive. Sin is offensive. And we should use biblical terms to describe biblical things. 29, and while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. Verse 30, for as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. God delivered Noah, I should say Jonah, from the whale's belly, which normally would be a person's grave. That miracle gave Jonah's preaching God's stamp of approval. Jesus appeared to hundreds of people after he was raised from the dead. His resurrection, that huge miracle, was God's stamp of approval on Christ and his message. And so people better pay attention to what Jesus says. Verse 31. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. The Queen of the South traveled a long way to hear the word of God in the days of Solomon. You can read about that in the Old Testament. And here you have these religious rulers who not only had the word of God, they had the Son of God, and they couldn't care less. They squandered a greater privilege, therefore their judgment will be more severe. 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The people of Nineveh were rotten to the core, but they repented when they heard Jonah preach the word of God. These rulers wouldn't repent when they heard God's word from God himself. They are storing up wrath for themselves in the day of God's wrath. No excuses. Verse 33. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket but on a lampstand, that those who come in may see the light. Every time Jesus did a miracle or spoke. He spoke the Word of God, of course, because He is God, but every time He did a miracle or spoke, the truth of God shined out of Him. So Jesus wasn't trying to conceal His identity, that's for sure. That's not why He refused to do another miracle for these people. No one covers a light, and Jesus wasn't trying to cover His identity. He already gave out plenty of light. They just willfully close their eyes because they love darkness. 34. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. If your eye isn't working, you are in the dark. You cannot see where you are going or what you are doing. It's as if all the lights are turned off in the room. Or it's as if it's, you know, one o'clock in the morning. Our attitude is our spiritual eye. The right attitude toward God makes it possible for him to teach us. It is like the word of God says. If anyone is willing to do God's will, he will know the truth. And the religious leaders were not willing. You see, that was their problem. That is why they were blind. They had, an, they had a bad attitude. So it was impossible for them to learn. 35. Therefore take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. Make sure your attitude is right. Make sure you want to know the truth. Make sure you are willing to do right when you know what, what is right. 
Make sure your attitude is right toward the truth, is what Jesus is saying. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. If you are surrendered to Christ, you will stand out from the rest of the world like a light shining in a dark room. Holiness makes us lights of moral sanity in this sin-crazy world. And if I'm not a spiritual light, then it is because I have been drawn into the world's attitude and I need to get out of it fast or I am useless to Jesus. 37. And as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down. Jesus walked in and headed right for the dinner table. 38. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. The ritual washings that the Pharisees went through and expected others to go through had nothing to do with the word of God. It shocked them when Jesus, Jesus ignored those washings, but he still ignored them. And he knew, of course, that they, they would be shocked. You see, Christ tried to get people to cut through the man-made stuff and get back to the pure word of God. And it is very important to separate personal convictions and human traditions, even religious traditions, from the pure word of God. One is binding, the other is not. Verse 39. But the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees make the outside of the cup and dish clean, but your inward part is full of greed and wickedness. You know, as long as the Pharisees appeared to be holy to others, they didn't care how filthy they actually were on the inside. Jesus says in verse 40, Foolish ones, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? God made our bodies and our souls. Now he would like us to take care of our outside, but more than anything he wants us to be good on the inside. 41. But rather give alms of such things as you have, then indeed all things are clean to you. Giving is a spiritual gauge. Do you know that? If our attitude is God, I will let go of whatever you want. I will give what you want me to give. I will spend my money on whatever it is you want me to spend it on. That is an indication of a healthy soul. Giving is a gauge of our spirit. It is a gauge of the holiness of our soul. 42. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by judgment and love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. The Pharisees were frauds and Jesus hated it. They made sure they tied every single dime they had. Give the Lord one penny out of every dime. Not a cent less and not a cent more. And they figured as long as they gave their 10%, it didn't matter if they were prideful and unfair in their treatment of others. 43. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Oh, they love sitting at the head table in big gatherings. In other words, they love to be flattered. Sinful pride is what motivated the Pharisees. They love to draw attention to themselves. 44. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like graves which are not seen, and the men who walk over them are not aware of them. According to Old Testament law, touching a grave, even unknowingly, would make a person ritually unclean for seven days meaning you could not attend religious services and offer sacrifices for seven days. Jesus called the Pharisees unmarked graves. People were being separated from God because of them without even realizing it. They were a dangerous group, and they were supposed to be spiritual directors, spiritual leaders. Verse 45, Then one of the lawyers answered and said to him, Teacher, by saying these things you reproach us also. And I don't know what this ruler is waiting for Jesus to say. Maybe he expects Jesus to apologize. You know, saying, I never would have spoken the truth if I thought it might upset someone. i will be waiting a long time before Jesus says that. 46. Jesus said, Woe to you also, 
you lawyers, so instead of apologizing, Jesus reloads. And he's going to let them have it again. Look at it. And he said, Woe to you also, you lawyers, for you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. In other words, you nearly break the people's backs with your religious rules, and you never do anything to help them. Really, it was a form of religious slavery, and the preachers were the slave drivers. Jesus does not tell his preachers and his pastors to whip his sheep. He says, feed my sheep. That means teach them the Word of God. Don't give them, you know, a beating every Sunday morning. Give them a feeding. 47. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets, and your fathers killed them. In Jesus' time, the tombs of the Old Testament prophets were decorated. Some people even built marble monuments for the tombs of the prophets. And of course the religious rulers joined in because it was such a great photo op for them. 48. In fact, you bear witness that you approve the deeds of your fathers, for they indeed killed them, and you build their tombs. Jesus says to the religious leaders of his day, he says, the tombs you build for the prophets are monuments to your murderous ancestors more than the prophets who they killed. You're, you're building these monuments, but actually you are honoring the murderers of the prophets rather than the prophets. And Jesus said that because he knew the religious rulers would kill the holy prophets just like their ancestors had done, just like they were planning on killing him. They were no different than the Israelites in the Old Testament days who persecuted Jeremiah and Isaiah, who was cut in half, according to legend. Unbelievable. Nothing changed. 49, therefore the wisdom of God also said, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persecute. And that's why God was wise when he said, in his word, I will send them prophets and apostles, but they will chase them away or kill them. 50. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. Past generations of Israelites paid for their rebellion. Jesus' generation knew that. But they didn't learn from it. And after they rejected John the Baptist and killed God's son and his apostles and other Christians, they got hit with God, with the wrath of God so hard in 70 A.D. that they still have not recovered from it. 52. Jesus says, Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered and the key of knowledge refers to God's Word the rulers did not ban the Bible they did not pass a law that banned the Bible instead they turned the Bible into a twisted puzzle that only they could figure out they rejected the clear common-sense meaning of God's Word and invented their own perverted meaning and in the process they damned themselves and those who looked to them for spiritual guidance 53, and as he said these things to them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to assail him vehemently and to cross-examine him about many things. You know, the truth is very simple. The rulers understood the truth that Jesus just spoke. The problem is, they hated the truth that he just spoke. And that's why they go on the attack against him. 54, lying in wait for him and seeking to catch him in something he might say, that they might accuse him. Jesus challenged their evil ways and they hated him because of that. Jesus had enough backbone to say, you guys are bad and you are teaching lies and God does not like it. And they wanted to kill Christ because of his holy boldness. Next time, chapter 12.